Washington, D.C. It is March 4th, the year 1913. President William Howard Taft. On this, his last day in office, President Taft carries out the will of the Congress of the United States. Acknowledging the condition of workers in this growing nation to be of public concern, a new department of the federal government is created, charged with a solemn mission to foster, promote, and develop the welfare of the wage earners of the United States, to improve their working conditions, and to advance their opportunities for profitable employment. conditions, employment opportunities, human labor purchased at cattle car prices and set to the dreary routine of tending steam-driven machines. Still they came, the tired, the poor, the tempest-tossed, drawn by a vision of plenty and the fact of personal freedom. These were among the department's first clients the millions of immigrants who had fled the futile servitude of an old world only to be trapped in the industrial ghettos of a new. Everywhere, workers' attempts to better their lot met with violence and legally sanctioned resistance. Unions and the lives they represented were often wrecked in battles of a different kind of American revolution. But now, these working men and women had a voice in the president's highest council. The resources seemed few. One bay horse named Mike, one wagon, a handful of dedicated people. Fifteen, for example, in the Women's Bureau, and 94 in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But they were enough to document the social and economic ills of a raw industrial society. Within a year, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot down by a Serbian patriot and the greatest war the world had known exploded in Europe. The Secretary of Labor remarked in 1917, Battles are fought not only between armed men, but between the factories, workshops and mines of the contending nations. His department, acting as the War Labor Administration, helped to see to it that this war was not lost on that front. Employment services to man the war effort, a women's land army, child labor laws, minimum wages, an eight-hour day, acknowledgement of workers' right to organize. By war's end, a new industrial society had emerged, one made in a modern image, one made through changes the department had urged and administered. From now on, crisis would underline the department's central role in social progress. Now it faced the challenges of the newly unemployed, the need for reconversion in a world assured of perpetual peace. Within months, 400 employment service representatives would offer assistance to employers and employees, farm workers and factory workers, skilled and unskilled. The high, wide and handsome 1920s brought undreamed of prosperity. The then Secretary of Labor declared, the material progress of America is one of the most astonishing things recorded in the annals of nations. Our wealth is 40% of the entire wealth of the earth. There was some problem, of course, in its distribution. 
The United States, which had saved the world for democracy, was a land of unlimited optimism and confidence. But beneath this surface of well-being, profound changes were taking place. While the fever of speculation pushed Wall Street's temperature to the boiling point, America's wage earners were bringing home dollars worth less and less. In an era of union busting, union membership was declining. The Child Labor Act was declared unconstitutional, a nicety of judicial interpretation lost on children in the mills and in the mines. And for the first time, a strange new concern, technological change, entered the reports of the Secretary of Labor. We shall be paying too dearly for the prosperity of a few if machines become so efficient as to impoverish the many by keeping them unemployed. Troubles? Yes. But nothing a prosperous nation could not take in its stride. Throughout its more than 50 years, the Department of Labor has been served by thousands of men and women who have shared the belief that America the Beautiful can be more than the title of a song. The inventory has come a long way from a bay horse named Mike and a stack of books. But the attitude hasn't changed. Nor has the name of the job. To foster, promote, and develop the welfare of the wage earners of the United States. Having known change and helped make it, the Department of Labor does not find in change a stranger nor an enemy. It is rather another name for opportunity.